Hi, everybody. My name is Carl Darden, and I'd like to welcome and thank all of you for joining us today on Navy Sports Central. I'm your host, and this is the official podcast of the Navy Sports Nation, where we take a deeper dive into Navy sports. In this episode, we're going to take a look at how the Navy football team has been progressing now that the spring practices are finishing up. This is also the last big weekend for the Army-Navy Star Series, with the men's and women's lacrosse teams and the baseball team looking to add to the mid's totals. They clinched the overall season series about three weeks ago, but are looking to close out the year strong. We'll talk about that in our sports update and bring you all of our usual segments as we get set to wrap up the spring sports season. So let's settle in and I'll get you all caught up. All right, it is great to be back with you all. My taxes have been filed and uh, now I can get back to doing the really important stuff. There are lots of things happening in the yard as we head into the last half of April. So let's go ahead and get things started with our sports update. I'm going to lead with gymnastics because there is some history made this past weekend at Penn State, which is where the NCAA championships were held. For the first time in 50 years, the Naval Academy has not just one, but two All-Americans in the sport. C.M. Burr de Gunta, who is a junior from Westboro, Massachusetts, and Isaiah Drake, a sophomore from Los Angeles, California, came away with All-America honors, and that's the first time that's happened since 1973. Burr de Gunta punched his ticket in the floor exercise, while Drake did it by excelling across the six apparatus in the all-around competition. That was highlighted by a third-place finish in the pommel horse. For them to achieve that status, they had to finish in the top eight overall. Both performances capped off an outstanding season for Navy Gymnastics. The team was undefeated in dual meets and won the ECAC championship for the fifth straight year. And I'll say right now that Isaiah Drake is someone you're going to want to keep your eye on for sure, because uh, last December, he placed 14th overall in the U.S. Gymnastics Championships in Tampa. That was good enough to land him a spot on the Olympic Senior National Development Team, Uh, And now he and coach Kip Simons have a plan in place to compete for a spot on the 2024 team that will be headed to Paris. So stay tuned as that continues to come together. Now let's go ahead and jump over to rugby. This past weekend, the Mids took on Army in the quarterfinals of the Division 1A championships, and it wasn't even close. Uh, The Mids won by a score of 30 to 6, and the Black Knights didn't get a single try the entire game. So their semifinal game will be this Saturday at home against Lindenwood University, and that's a school that's located in St. Charles, Missouri. Now, if Navy gets past them, they will advance to the national championship, which will be played in Houston. The team is led by Lewis Gray, who is their uh, leading points producer. He's got 161, with uh, 80 of those points coming from 16 tries. And right behind him with uh, 103 points is Ronan Krieger. I've mentioned it a couple of times on the, um, on the group Facebook page, but I will be headed to Annapolis this weekend to watch the Army-Navy lacrosse game. And since it is a night game, it's going to give me an opportunity to check out some of the other sports in the yard, such as uh, Navy track and also the rugby game. So I'm actually going to try and make it over to the rugby center. Uh, I think that's a noon start time there. And um, my goal, you know, if the weather cooperates, is to get some pictures taken and and things like that. But uh, I've never actually seen a rugby game live. So I'm curious to see what that atmosphere is going to be like. All right, now I'd like to go ahead and check in with the uh, baseball team. And, um, you know, they've actually found a nice rhythm lately and have climbed into second place in the Patriot League standings with a 12-6 and record. Uh, they still have seven league games to go, including a big three-game series against Army for the final star of the spring season. The Black Knights are currently in first place, two games ahead of the mids. Navy's pitching staff is led by Nate Mitchell. He is a senior from Parker, Colorado, which is actually the next town over from where I used to live. Uh, Mitchell has started nine games, going 6-2 and two over that stretch with one no decision. His earned run average is a sparkling 2.41, which leads the team, and he's also second in strikeouts with 43. The mid's top reliever in terms of saves is Landon Kruer. He is a sophomore from Sellersburg, Indiana. He's got eight saves and averages about one strikeout per inning pitched. At the plate, the team has four guys batting 300 or higher. Uh, Kyle Rauch leads that group, hitting 323. He also has 26 runs batted in, which is second to Logan Keller's 27. And by the way, Keller is one of the other 300 hitters, along with Alex Smith and Eduardo Diaz. The Mids are playing some really good baseball right now. Uh, That series against Army coming up this weekend is a big one, and it could be a preview of what we'll see in the Patriot League tournament if things hold the way they are now with respect to the standings. Finally, I'm going to close out this update with a couple of thoughts on both of the lacrosse games that are coming up. This is probably the first time that both teams will be underdogs when they face Army. That's actually been true on the men's side for the last couple of years, but the mids dominated the Black Knights two years ago in Annapolis, and then last year they upset them in overtime up at West Point. This year, Army is ranked sixth, but the mids have been playing exceptionally well these last four games, having knocked off Loyola and Boston University, both of whom were ranked teams. Um, 
I'm guessing this could be a real defensive battle. The Mids have held their last four opponents to less than 10 goals a game, or I should say 10 goals or less. Um, Army's just allowed barely over eight goals a game the entire season. The Mids have been banged up for most of the year on offense. Uh, Dane Swanson and Patrick Skalniak have been out for the last several games. Uh, Xavier Arline is nursing an injury, and plus he'd been busy the last few weeks at uh, spring football practices. But uh, guys like Henry Tolker have really stepped up big. And when you consider the fact that this is Army-Navy, uh, just about anything can happen. So I'm really looking forward to the game. On the women's side, the Mids lost to Army for the first time last year in the Star game. Then they turned around and crushed them in the Patriot League tournament. I think the score there was like 16-6. to Army had been playing really well, but then they just got dismantled by Loyola 19-5. to So they're probably going to be pretty fired up on Saturday. Coach Tim Shell has settled on some pretty strong rotations, and the Mids are playing with a lot of poise. One name that you've heard me say before is Eva Jovino. This will be her first star game, um, and from what I've seen so far, she is absolutely fearless. So I'm looking for her to have a really strong game setting up her teammates and then uh, getting off her shot when she can. Now, considering the difference in experience between the two teams, and, and I say that knowing that the mids haven't really been playing like a young team of late, but this would be a memorable win for the women's team if they can pull it off. The uh, opening draw will go down at 2.30 Eastern, and ESPN Plus will have the coverage. Okay, we're going to go ahead and roll into our Ask Me Anything segment before we take our break. And uh, we've actually got two really good questions that came up this time around. The uh, first one is from my classmate, Doug Conkey, who has contributed to this segment before. So, Doug, thanks again for sending in your question. This one is focused on rugby. And, and Doug's asking, now that rugby is a varsity sport, how do the coaches go about recruiting players, especially on the women's side? So I had a chance to do a little digging around on this question, and, and here's what I found out. Right now, there are 1,200 high schools across the country that have rugby programs, and more than 26,000 boys and 8,700 girls play the sport, according to USA Rugby, both at the club and high school level. And I also took a look at the high school rankings. The one thing that jumped out at me was that the strong programs are spread all across the country. Uh, The top 10 included teams from Virginia, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Texas, Utah, and California. And uh, to tell you the truth, I didn't even know that rugby was that popular at the high school and club level until I started looking into this. So as far as recruiting goes, it looks like the coaches have a pretty well-defined pipeline. And now that rugby is a varsity sport for both the men and the women, they're likely going to have some kind of recruiting budget. Now, it may not be all that big, but I'm sure the coaches are going to know where to spend that money. The bulk of the work is going to consist of building those relationships with the high school and club coaches. And I do think that the long-term benefits that the academy has to offer would be very appealing to the athletes who want to continue playing rugby in college. And I'm sure there's still a bit of on-campus recruiting going on also. There could be some really good football players or, or maybe even soccer players on the women's side who might have a tough time moving up the depth chart because of the position they play. So I'm thinking that the coaches are always keeping their eyes open for those kinds of players as well. So, Doug, thanks again for the question. Um, I actually thought that there's going to be a little bit more of an issue with regard to setting up the infrastructure when it came to uh, high school recruiting, but apparently it's further along than I thought. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out moving forward, because obviously uh, the academy already has an elite program. So um, being able to attract top-level athletes, I think, is going to be uh, uh, something that they shouldn't have too much of a problem doing. Our next question is from Tom Mortensen, who is also a classmate and a regular contributor to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page, and his has to do with the Army-Navy Star Series, so here's Tom's question. We know the Army-Navy record in football, but when did Navy start playing Army in other sports, and what is the overall record for each? And finally, when did we start tracking the Star Series? Uh, I don't remember that going on when we were mids in the early 1980s. So, Tom, it's an awesome question, and I'm going to go ahead and answer it one piece at a time. Uh... As most of you may know, the very first Army-Navy football game was played in 1890. The Mids won that 24 to nothing. But it was another 13 years before the rivalry expanded to a second sport. And that was in 1903 when baseball was added. The uh, Black Knights came out on top in that first matchup, 8 to 2. Now, as far as the overall record for each sport, that can be found on the Navy Sports webpage. And um, I'll put all this in the show notes, but all you need to do is go to NavySports.com and find the Athletic Department tab at the top. When you hover over that, it'll give you a drop-down menu, and then if you slide over to the far left, you'll see the second option that says Army-Navy Series. When you click on that, it gives you a ton of information. First, you'll see the all-time Army-Navy record for all sports, and Navy leads that with 1,161 wins against 870 losses and 44 ties. After that, you're going to see the overall and star series records for the last 10 years, then last year, and also the current year to date. 
And then finally, you're going to see each sport listed typically in the order that they are played. And they will show to the far right Navy's record against the Black Knights in each of those sports. And I believe that out of the 26 sports where Navy and Army go head to head, the Black Knights only lead in five of them. And, and, and a couple of those are very, very close within like, you know, between one and five contests. Now, as far as when the star competition first started getting tracked, that began in 1979, according to Navy Sports Information. It just hasn't been publicized until about 10 to 15 years ago. And I don't know when the schools came to an agreement with USAA to sponsor the series. If I had to guess, I'd say it was within the last five to 10 years. So again, Tom, thanks for a great question. And I'm also going to include a link to a previous podcast episode, that would be number 17, that really does explore the Army-Navy rivalry in a lot more detail. I think you'll find that one to be pretty interesting. Okay, our deep dive segment is coming up next, so stay with us. All right, it is time for our deep dive segment, and with the spring football practices wrapping up, I figured it would be a good time for us to take a look and see what's going on with the team. Uh, as most of you know, these sessions provide an opportunity for the coaching staff to get an early look at their returning players. And even more importantly for the mids, there are several new members of the staff that Coach Newberry has brought on who are unfamiliar with the environment at Navy. They won't have as much time with the players as they would at other schools, so this is a time for them to figure out what they need to do to adapt. Now, there are a total of 15 practice sessions held during the spring. Um, eight of them involve live contact, and three of those live contact practices can be set up so that the players are going at it pretty hard uh, for more than half of the session. These are basically your scrimmages. The rules on contact used to be different, but there have been several changes made over the years to protect the uh, players. And just another note, uh, the mids used to end the spring session with a blue and gold game in front of the fans. They stopped that about 10 years ago because the coaches felt they could get a lot more value out of that extra practice session. Coach Newberry did mention that he was open to doing something along those lines next year, but uh, with all the changes that have occurred in the last three months, it just made a lot more sense to uh, stick to what they've been doing in the past. Now, this spring in particular has been a very busy one. New offensive coordinator Grant Chestnut has been hard at work installing his system. It is option-based, but from what he was saying, two-thirds of it is going to be completely new, so the offense has got a lot of work to do between now and the beginning of the season. Coach Chestnut also wants to make the offense a little bit more unpredictable by running a lot of sets out of the shotgun or the pistol. Obviously, the mids have used these formations in the past, but it was mostly situational. I'm thinking that Coach Chestnut wants to keep the defense guessing on every play instead of them getting used to seeing the same formations across the line of scrimmage on each down. Naturally, some of the biggest questions that come up during the spring practices are related to quarterback development. Uh, Ty Levitai and Xavier Ireland will be entering their senior seasons. But Lavatai is still recovering from a torn ACL, and Arline's time on the field has been limited because of an injury he suffered during a recent lacrosse game. That means that Coach Jasper has spent most of the time during this spring session developing the three rising sophomores. Those guys are Teddy Gleaton, Blake Horvath, and Drayvon Ponder. Gleaton and Horvath have gotten the majority of the reps. Uh, Ponder is still getting over an injury, so he's been sidelined recently. All three of those players possess outstanding talent, though. Based on what the coaches have been saying, Gleaton has made some really big strides picking up the offense in the last week or so. Uh, Coach Chestnut made a point of singling him out during an interview last Thursday. He appears to be the best passer between him and Horvath. Uh, his biggest challenge is making the right decisions with the football within the option scheme. I did want to point out here that Gleaton is a very good instinctive runner, and at 6'1", 214 pounds, he's not going to be that easy to bring down. Horvath is from Ohio, and he came from a school that did use a version of the option, uh, in fact, he set a number of records for most rushing yards and most rushing touchdowns. Coach Jasper mentioned that Horvath just needs to continue developing his passing skills to make him more of a threat. Now, we all know that from watching the team in the past, one of the most critical components when running the option and this new look that Coach Chestnut will be installing is the offensive line. Both he and Coach Ingram are getting those pieces in place. They've got four very experienced linemen returning. They are center Lirian Moretzi, guards Josh Pena and Ahmad Bradley, and tackle Sam Glover. All those guys are seniors, and that's usually a good thing. You can also expect them to continue getting cross-trained at one of the other positions to improve the team's overall depth. I'll leave the evaluation of how the offensive line is coming along to the coaches, but historically, the unit tends to perform really well when the majority of them are seniors, as is the case this year, especially when they have this kind of experience, because all those guys I just named have gotten a ton of playing time over the last two to three seasons. And the last time that Navy had an offensive line returning with this kind of experience was back in 2019, which turned out to be a record-breaking year. 
Uh, by the way, here are a couple other things worth noting on the offensive side of the ball. Um, Anton Hall Jr. has made the switch from fullback to slot back. This will give the mids both speed and strength on the perimeter. Um, Hall weighs 198 pounds, which is at least 15 to 20 pounds heavier than any other slot back on the team. So that should be pretty fun to watch. The uh, second thing is, in addition to coaching the quarterbacks, Coach Jasper has responsibility for the fullbacks as well. Uh, this makes sense since it's so important for these two positions to be reading from the same sheet of music. And Jasper has coached the fullbacks before. Uh, this was quite a while back when uh, Coach Neil Matalolo first took over the Navy program. Then, a couple years later, he moved exclusively to uh, quarterback development. Now he's got the fullbacks again, and uh, led by rising junior Dabba Fufana, they will be looking to increase their uh, production over last year. All right, as far as some key takeaways, um, there are some places where the team is already looking pretty good this year. And, you know, recognizing that it is a spring, obviously there's still a lot of improvement to be made. But I think most fans will agree that the defense is probably the team's biggest strength. Uh, the mids held the highest producing offenses in the American Conference last year to well below their season averages in both points and yards. And this year there will be some tweaks, but uh, new defensive coordinator P.J. Volker has been with Coach Newberry for seven years. And they are as like-minded as it gets when it comes to their defensive philosophy, which is basically to uh, create as much chaos as possible. The uh, Miz have thrived in this system over the last several years, and I don't expect this season to be any different. Now, the position group I'm most excited to watch this year is the secondary. Um, This unit was outstanding last year when it came to supporting the run defense, uh, but they did give up a number of big plays over the top in games that ended up giving momentum back to the opponent. So to address that issue, Coach Newberry hired Eric Lewis as the uh, defensive passing game coordinator. He is the son of Sherman Lewis, who's one of the best NFL defensive coaches that the game has ever seen. So you've got that, and then you've got experienced defensive backs like Rayon Lane, Mabiti Williams, and Elias Larry returning. So I'm confident there's going to be some nice improvement in the secondary's ability to limit the uh, number of big plays this season. As far as some of the question marks go... I think the preseason practices will be an opportunity for Coach Chestnut to figure out which quarterback would be the best fit, at least early on. Gleaton has had a pretty decent spring, but assuming that Ty Levitai makes a full recovery, he'll have a chance to show what he can do running the new scheme uh, during the preseason. I've got a really good feeling about the offensive line, though. Uh, Besides the defense, that's probably the unit that has the most continuity, and if they can stay healthy, I think the offense is going to perform pretty well. So now I want to go ahead and give you some background on some of the players that the coaches have uh, singled out. And and I've mentioned a couple of them already. Now, for those of you who don't know, the uh, coaching staff recognizes the most improved player during spring ball with the William P. Mack Award. Um, This year, that honor goes to defensive end Justin Reed. He is a rising junior from Apex, North Carolina. Now, it's not like he just burst on the scene. Reed has played in every single game during his first two seasons at Navy. And that also includes two starts. So far in his career, he's had a total of 19 tackles, 2.5 of those have been for a loss, and he's also gotten one sack and one fumble recovery. Uh, The Mids look to have another strong defensive line this year. All three projected starters are seniors. Uh, Nose guard Donald Berniard, uh, otherwise known as Biscuit, is uh, coming off in another outstanding year. And then he's going to be joined by Clay Cromwell at defensive tackle, and also Jacob Busick, who Reed will actually be coming in for whenever Busick needs a breather. There were some other players that made a big impression on the coaches this spring as well, and here are a few to keep your eyes on when the preseason practices begin in August. Uh, First up is Alex Texa. His last name is T-E-C-Z-A. I think I'm pronouncing that right. He's a sophomore fullback from Lebanon, Pennsylvania. He's gotten some attention by breaking off some really nice long runs during the scrimmages. So even with Hall moving to slot back, it looks like the mids will still have the ability to pull off some explosive plays from that fullback position. Now, moving on to the offensive line, we have rising junior Javon Bouton. Uh, He's been getting quite a bit of work at right tackle and has been doing a good job holding his own. Clearly, the more depth we have on the offensive line, the better. Defensively, rising sophomore James Perkins has been getting a lot of attention at the Raider position. He has impressed the coaches with his athleticism, and uh, the same goes for safety Jackson Campbell. So those are just some of the players that you can kind of keep your eyes open for once the uh, preseason practices start. Overall, I think the general feeling from the coaching staff has been, you know, we're happy with where we've gotten to up to this point, but there's still a long way to go. And I I think that's a pretty fair assessment as far as I'm concerned. Uh, Certainly, there's plenty of reason to be excited with the anticipation of a new-ish offensive scheme. I guess I'll go with that terminology. But uh, no team is ready to take on a legit opponent after just 15 practices. So, of course, the preseason will bring a higher level of intensity and competition. After they wrap things up on Wednesday, the coaches will put out a depth chart. But that's obviously going to be a starting point, and I'll go ahead and share that with you when it comes out um, on our group Facebook page.
Without a doubt, the uh, picture will become much more clear on August the 26th. That's when Navy travels to Dublin, Ireland to take on Notre Dame. Okay, coming up next, I'm going to finish up the deep dive segment by giving you an early take on the upcoming season, so don't go anywhere. We are back here at Navy Sports Central. Carl Darden here with you. And I thought I would finish off this segment by uh, sharing my thoughts on the 2023 football season, which is going to be here before you know it. Um, I figure the best place to start is with the team's goal of winning the Commander Chiefs trophy. Now, I get that some of you feel that uh, beating Army is the primary goal each year, and I don't disagree with that. But uh, the fact is, winning the trophy is a close second, and the Mids always play Air Force first on the schedule, so it makes more sense to talk about these two things together. Now, the big question is, does Navy have a legitimate shot at winning the Commander Chiefs trophy back this year? Um, I'll tell you that my answer is yes, primarily because it's an odd-numbered year. And uh, I know that sounds a little bit strange, but the reason I say that is because the Mids always play Air Force at home in odd-numbered years, and the last three times they've won the trophy has been in odd-numbered years. That would be 2013, 2015, and 2019. Uh, Now, the Falcons are projected to get eight wins this year, according to ESPN. That shouldn't come as a big surprise, uh, because (laughs) with all those crazy exceptions they had instituted during COVID, they probably still have a bunch of players playing an extra year. Uh, Remember, they got slapped to the two-year probation also last season, and my own personal opinion is that should have disqualified them from winning the uh, Commander Chiefs trophy, but uh, you know that's another story. In any case, the uh, Navy Air Force games in Annapolis are usually pretty competitive. Um, that wasn't so much the case a couple years ago offensively, but the defense did keep the Falcons in check for most of the game until they just got tired in the fourth quarter. I just think the Mids have a real shot at winning the game on October 21st, assuming the quarterback situation is settled and the team goes into the game uh, fairly healthy. Now, As far as the Army game goes, the weather could be even more of a factor due to the fact that they're going to be playing up in Foxborough, Massachusetts this year. Uh, But besides that, I think the Mids will be thoroughly prepared after what happened last season. Army's schedule includes two games against FCS opponents and a third game against a UMass team that's gone 2-22 the last two seasons. So again, the scheduling there kind of favors the Black Knights a little bit, but... uh, I do believe the Mids will be more tested because of their schedule, and they'll be ready to play Army when that game rolls around. Now, there's no doubt in my mind that the Mids had the better team last year, but in a game like Army-Navy, that's not enough. Um, It's all about execution from the opening kickoff until the time when the clock shows all zeros, and, um, you know, it just didn't happen for them last year. That's just football. The one thing I do know is that Coach Newberry does not want to rely on emotion to win games. Uh, He made a great point of that, in the beginning of spring practice, he said that it is tough to rely on emotion to win football games. Emotion has peaks and valleys, and that can lead to inconsistent play. It has to be all about execution. If that's the focus and the team consistently out executes the guys on the other side of the ball, the result is probably going to be a good one. So I think the team has a pretty good chance of bringing the Commander in Chief's trophy back to Annapolis. Um, it's time to end that three game losing streak against Air Force, and I think the Mids have a good shot of doing it at home. And we need to get another winning streak started against Army also. I'm not expecting anything like 14 games again. I'd actually be happy with just two or three. As far as the next goal, which is qualifying for a bowl game, that's reachable also. Uh, in 2022, Navy was a handful of plays away from being 6-6. Six and six. Um, That was a good Delaware team the Mids played to open the season, but there were several miscues on offense that really hurt them and cost them the win. And um, I'm not going to rehash the Army result again. Uh, we all know what happened there. This season, I think Navy's schedule is a little bit easier. I think it may have covered the opponents in a previous episode, but for those of you who may not have heard it, um, here's what it looks like. First of all, there are six home games um, against Wagner, which is an FCS school, South Florida, North Texas, Air Force, Alabama, Birmingham, and East Carolina. And there are a total of four away games, those being against Memphis, Charlotte, Temple, and SMU. And of course, we're going to have the two neutral site games against uh, Notre Dame in Dublin, Ireland, which I'd mentioned before and also against Army in Foxborough. Now, just on paper, there does look to be six wins there. The nice thing is the team has six home games. Last year, they only had five at Navy Marine Corps Stadium. Uh, Notre Dame was considered a home game, but it was played up in Baltimore, which, you know, it's just not the same. I I, I get it's not that far up the road, but uh, um, Navy does tend to play better at home in their own stadium. 
Anyway, I get the sense that there's going to be a different kind of feel in uh, Navy Marine Corps Stadium for the uh, for the home games. And a lot of that just comes from, you know, the new coaching staff, the new anticipated offense that's going to be put in. You know, that whole newness factor has a way of generating a lot of excitement. Uh, and even though Coach Newberry doesn't want the Mids relying on their own emotion to win games, uh, the fans' emotion does have a way of impacting how the other team plays. And that can often prove to be the difference. So I'm looking forward to seeing that. You know, I'm not going to be able to make it out to a home game this fall. Um, I'm going to have to save that for next year when uh, when I'm out there for my reunion. But of course, I will be watching them on TV. So I'll be curious to see if there is any significant change in the fan emotion and how that affects the outcome of the game. To uh, kind of wrap things up, I do see six wins in there somewhere for the mids. I'm not going to sit there and break down every single game and, and try to make a prediction, but I definitely think there's six wins in there someplace, which will qualify them for a bowl game. So now it's just a matter of going out and doing it. We'll be right back. All right. Thanks for staying with us on Navy Sports Central. And now it is time for our question of the day. Before we get to it, let's go ahead and take a look at the one from our last episode. My guest was David Levin, the author of Raise Your Inner Game. Our conversation centered around how athletes can eliminate distractions and sharpen their focus so they can perform at a higher level. Here's what I was asking. Over the years, we've seen mids with strong mental games perform at an extremely high level in their respective sports. Name one male and one female athlete who've had the confidence, resilience, and focus to consistently deliver when it counted at crunch time. Now, I did go away from the poll question format because I didn't want to influence any choices, but uh, (laughs) I guess I should have gone ahead and done that because this was the first time in a long time where we just didn't get any responses. Uh, And again, part of that might be on me because I just didn't, you know, highlight it enough. But anyway, it's no big deal. Uh, For one thing, it's good feedback for me to stick with poll questions from now on. Uh, So I'm going to go ahead and give you my answers here. On the men's side, I went back and forth looking at how Keenan Reynolds and Malcolm Perry performed during their careers at Navy. Uh, During their senior year, it's pretty much impossible to separate them based on what they did on the field. They both led their teams to 11-2 records, the Commander Chiefs Trophy, and a big bowl win. Um, They seemed to come through whenever it mattered most. Uh, But the question said, name only one athlete. So I went with Reynolds based on the fact that he was a four-year starter. Um, That's no knock on Perry because he was more dominant against Army his senior year. And it was his last-minute heroics against Air Force and Tulane that resulted in the mids winning those two games. But I got to go with Reynolds if we're going to be looking at all four years. He came up huge against Army his freshman season in the fourth quarter, scoring a winning touchdown, or at least what turned out to be the winning touchdown. And he was also dominant in his sophomore year when the mids won 34-7. Finally, he beat them two more times to become the only Navy quarterback to go 4-0 against the Black Knights. So it was close, but Reynolds just gets the nod on this one. Now, on the women's side, my choice is Jennifer Coleman from the class of 22. I know the Navy women's basketball program had started rebuilding during her senior year, but without her, the season would have been a complete disaster. No matter who the mids were playing, you could basically pencil Coleman in for a double-double. In fact, she averaged over 20 points and 10 rebounds a game for the entire year. That led the team in both categories, and she was also first in assists and steals. But the one game that points to Coleman's ability to stay confident and resilient was when the Mids took on top-seeded Holy Cross in the Patriot League Tournament quarterfinals. She scored the team's last nine points, all from beyond the arc, including one from the deep corner that just barely beat the buzzer, giving Navy a huge upset. Coleman played every minute of that game except for one, and she played all 40 minutes in several other games throughout the year. That's how much the team leaned on her. So, that's my answer to the question from our last episode. Now let's get to the one for this week. It is football-related, and here it is. Navy's offense averaged just over 85 passing yards per game last season. The new option-based system that Coach Grant Chestnut is installing will feature more run-pass option plays out of the shotgun and other quick-hitting passes out to the perimeter. Knowing that, how many passing yards per game do you think the mids will average this year? So our choices are A, 90 to 99 yards, B, 100 to 109 yards, C, 110 to 119 yards, and finally D, 120 yards or more per game. Think about that for a little while and let me know your answers. You can respond by going to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page, and it will be posted by the end of the day. I'll also make a note of this one so we can track how things go once the season starts. All right, now let's go ahead and finish things up with our Midwatch segment. And I'll start by saying it was a huge week for both of our tennis players. 
Emily Tannenbaum continued her terrific season by setting a new record for the most combined singles and doubles wins in one year. She has 28 wins in singles to go along with 21 doubles victories. Uh, Tannenbaum picked up that 49th win in her match against Loyola on April the 12th, and that breaks the previous record of 48 set back in uh, 2013. The uh, team finished 4-1 and one in uh, Patriot League play, and that tournament starts uh, on April the 28th. The mids will go in as the number two seed behind Boston University. Jumping over to the men's side, Luke Garner was the key reason why Navy ended up taking that star against Army last weekend. He and his partner Sasha Panyan won their number one doubles match to help stake the mids to a 1-0 lead after the number three doubles team won their match. Then, after Panyan and J.J. Etterbeek picked up wins in the number one and number five singles matches, Navy increased their lead to 3-1 to one and looked to be in a position to end things quickly. But uh, then, Army ended up picking up victories at number two and number six singles, and that left it all up to Luke Garner, who was all even after two sets in his number three singles match against Army's Vishnu Badavula. Garner managed to get an early service break and ended up closing things out by winning the third set 6-3, giving their mids their 14th star in this year's competition. It's not over yet, though. Uh, next up are the Patriot League Championships, which uh, take place this weekend up at Colgate University. And I've got to figure that Garner will play a big role as the Mids try to defend their title. And that's going to do it for this edition of Navy Sports Central. Thank you all so much for joining us. Now, if you like what you've heard, be sure to follow us wherever you get your podcasts. And remember to spread the word to all the other Navy fans out there. We have been getting a great response to our question of the day. So if you want to jump in on that, just go to the Navy Sports Nation group Facebook page. I will go ahead and pin it to the top uh, so you won't miss it. And just a quick reminder, the views expressed on Navy Sports Central are my own and do not reflect those of the U.S. Naval Academy or Navy Athletics. By the way, the music used in Navy Sports Central comes to you courtesy of Audio Jungle. This is a great site for purchasing the rights to use music from thousands of artists around the world. And those we feature in the podcast will be credited in our show notes. Talk to you soon, everybody. Until next time, this is Carl Darden. Go Navy, beat Army. <laughs>